Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session, just about the afternoon. And uh, thanks very much to Claire. I think she's put together an amazing program. It's been really interesting listening to all of the speakers. Um, and I think maybe possibly she's saved the best uh, till last because we have three great speakers now to take you uh, after lunch or uh, into lunch indeed. I see uh, Jonathan Egan's uh, comment there about the music. It's terrific. I just felt like I should have a martini in my hand, <laughs> but I am wearing scrubs, so maybe I shouldn't. Uh, it's to remind people of Starbucks and when we used to be able to go to coffee shops, Suzanne. <laughs> oh, God. What is it to go places? So uh, our first speaker now in this session is uh, Dr. Veronica O'Doherty. Uh, Veronica is a clinical psychologist and head of department in Tala Hospital. And she has a re research interest in positive psychology and mindfulness. And she has published a lot in this area, including recently. For those of you who follow uh, Dr. O'Doherty on Twitter, uh, I think you, you, you will love her messages that she puts up where she just takes something and reframes it in such a positive way. It's, it's an absolute joy to, to read her tweets. We are delighted uh, that Dr. O'Doherty has joined us today to share her insight on supporting healthcare staff during this grueling period in healthcare. First, firstly, I'm, I'm kind of humbled to be here amongst such um, fantastic people who've been doing absolutely wonderful work, um, both uh, at the front line and um, on the research side of it um, as clinicians um, and researchers. And I suppose I've, I've put up this slide here just to acknowledge maybe the the level of grief um and i think claire you spoke about that at the beginning that you know we're all experiencing the the loss and the grief of of our normal lives and uh, this is somewhere i would um get uh, a lot of pleasure from um it's it's a place in majorca in port de solier and there's beautiful mountain walks um, and it's 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 like a it's almost like a piece of Tuscany in Spain, and it's it's a beautiful spot, and it ha also has the beach. And I'm missing being able to go over there and get my, as as we used to say, or and or rest and relaxation. And um, I think we're all missing those parts, so it's quite challenging sometimes to do some of the things that we used to do that would help us on the job. Um, and I suppose when when the um, first cases started uh, coming on our TV screens back in um, November, December from Wuhan, um, I did have a sense of trepidation that this could expand. Um, I'm sure like many other colleagues who were watching this and, you know, from December, January, February, I started looking at the research in, in, in previous epidemics like um, Ebola and SARS. And in my past history, I trained as a nurse um, in the Royal City of Dublin um, Hospital in Baggett Street. And um, I worked for a, a little bit of time in, an IC, in, in ICU. So I had an awareness that this would impact on ICU particularly, um, obviously it impacts on all hospital staff. Um, and, you know, at that stage, we started really flying through research papers. And uh, like Neil Greenberg was talking about the, the, the concept of growth happening during trauma, um, one of the things that I certainly noticed was the incredible sharing of information worldwide that was unprecedented and the access to papers um, that were just, you know, it, it was just phenomenal and it was really helpful, even though often there was too many papers, but um, being able to speed read through a lot of the research and and particularly from from our Chinese colleagues initially to, to see what was helping them as the, as they were going through this first. 
So um, we started setting up support groups through WhatsApp for psychologists. And again, we shared information throughout Ireland, anybody who came onto that group. Um, and that was very useful. And I'm conscious that even though we might have rolled out a service in um, Tala University Hospital, TUH for short, we, we weren't the only ones doing this. People started to, um, in their own individual services, rolled out um, lots of uh, intranet supports, intranet supports, local supports. Um, and we were building a, a I suppose, a, a community of, of psychology that was trying to address what, what we could see was going to happen. And I suppose one of my favorite quotes is this one, authenticity is a collection of choices we have to make every day. And it's about the choice to show up, be real, the choice to be honest, and the choice to let our true selves be seen. And to me, as a clinician and, and as a psychology manager in a service, one of the things that I really believe that managers and all of us on our, on our teams can do for each other is be authentic. And I think that allows space for those, as, as Professor Greenberg names, the savvy conversations to take place. Because I'm not in an ivory tower. I'm a, a human being first and I'm a healthcare professional second. And to bring that human level of, do you know what? I'm afraid too, this is affecting me too. That allows um, team members to be able to express those fears. Um, one of the things you, you, uh, you know, currently, I suppose, in the last number of years, the whole concept of influencers and it's often used in, in the context of, of um, famous celebrities and that. But I think we have our famous people in science and in healthcare. And um, Mark, uh, Mike Ryan of The Who, I think it, it really is the quote of the, the pandemic. And he says, be fast, have no regrets. If you need to be right before you move, you will never win. And he said that back in March 2020. And that really struck me that we needed to do something now, we, not to wait um, until things started to emerge. So in Tala, and you know, a lot of this, um, again, uh, others have, have named and alluded to, but you know, part of this was to get a service up and running as quickly as possible in our hospital for our staff. And as our, um, in, in the psychology department, as, as the outpatients were, were um, stopped temporarily, and as our teams were um, getting ready to provide virtual um, clinical consultations for patients, we had a little bit of a gap where we could just run with this. And I created a policy and all our team inputted into that. Um, and we researched what other people had done before to support staff. And the first piece um, that I was very interested in um, and occupational health had, had looked at this in our hospital before was the concept of um, uh, crisis intervention programs like psychological um, support systems that came from disaster um, situations. And Johns Hopkins um, were first out of the block with this when they started the um, re resilience training for people who had been in earthquakes and fires um, and, and obviously um, Professor Greenberg had been doing similar work. And they're, they're not that different. They're all um, based, based on the same concepts. And um, the core elements of any crisis program is really prevention, um, prevention of um, the sequelae of trauma, um, 
education. So it's support. It's not counselling at this point in time. And um, provision of caring, supportive services, compassionate, active leadership. And a, and a colleague of um, Professor Greenberg, Michael West, and um, Professor Michael West in the King's Fund is um, actively um, doing wonderful work on um, compassionate leadership across the UK, um, Northern Ireland and in Ireland. And I'll be following that with great interest. And the importance, as has been said, of peer supports and buddy systems. And again, the buddy system to ICU staff is, is a concept that was always used and theatre staff in relation to PPE and supporting colleagues to put on the PPE but using that in a psychological manner, that is about somebody who is charged with um, watching out for their colleague and maybe saying things like, you look a bit tired, you need a drink, um, do you need a rest, you know, pulling somebody, somebody else in to take over. So having that um, sense of community and sense of caring and support whilst in the unit itself. Um, so why does it matter? And, you know, stress, uh, Fiona, um, Professor Fiona McNichols spoke about this eloquently. Stress affects how we act, think and feel. It can actually cause injuries. And again, John Hopkins went further um, when they developed the RISE programme. And that was developed in, in relation to what they called, uh, and I know they're debating this term, but what they called... Um, secondary um, injuries to staff when there's when there's a situation or an error that that causes a patient um, a difficulty and these can be uh, minor or they can be serious and the um, the term second victim which is the staff member who's involved maybe in a legal case or in a situation um, even if it's managed at local level can be very traumatic and this is something that needs to continue on um, post pandemic because these issues are there every day so um, stress can cause injuries and illnesses as we know and workers do need protection too training in resilience systems and at individual and team level can really help and i'm conscious that often healthcare workers will say you know, I don't want just to be given the responsibility of being resilient. Um, it needs to be the whole system. And I would certainly concur with that. And when we rolled out um, Zoom resilience training, um, we were conscious that it was system wide and it was done at team level. So mental health is obviously important to our whole well-being, and even the World Health Organization says there is no such thing as health without mental health. Um, and again, it is completely normal to have a um, reaction to what we've all experienced and are still experiencing as a very abnormal event. And the goal of resiliency is just to minimize the impact of traumatic events. So we're trying to avoid cases of depression, anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorders. So what we did, we adapting our psychological response to our own local context. Um, we started, as I said, gathering all the resources. We did all our team members trained in um, uh, the um, psychological um, first aid, which is the John Hopkins program and um, Professor Neil Greenberg's program is, is probably somewhat similar to that, as he'd say himself. And we created a, si a system pathway and put a draft proposal into um, the senior management team. We also created a virtual resilience team Zoom training which was a 40 minute training because we knew it had to be rapid um, because people were busy. And um, we liaised with Oc Health and HR. We got buy-in from Lucy Nugent, our CEO. And um, we also had discussions with ICT 
as to how we'd roll this out. And um, SwiftQ, one of the platforms, actually um, facilitated us for free, where staff could go in and request a callback from one of the psychology team. And at that time, we had 11 psychologists and our staff is over 3,000. So it was a small service that we were able to provide. But I think it really mattered to staff that we were doing this and that they could avail of it if they needed to. And just an aside, you know, to say that part of the um, John Hopkins RISE programme, in the first year that they did this and they rolled this out, um, they didn't have high numbers. But as the service was advertised and people started to use it, um, it became um, much more, uh, it, it became used by a lot more people and the numbers started to grow. So the stigma started to break down. I think that's important to say because I noticed 40% or something of people in Tara's study um, valued um, psychological supports which isn't which isn't too bad it's it's not too low um, I, I was pleased to see that um, so so again I'm not going to go through this we've already established this the needs of people in the context of a psychosocial uh, crisis where the psychosocial needs the footprint is much larger and um, I think I got this from the WHO um, website and you can see the different phases there, the acute, the transition and the long term, and that um, psychological needs are, uh, you know, are, are going to, as we know, trauma and PTSD present later on. So we're going to see more of this later. Um, and we're all begin already beginning to see aspects of that. Um, next slide, please. So what what. Um, psychological first aid is not it's generally not something only professionals can do and if we'd had more time we would have tried to train lots more people in the hospital to do this at, at peer support level um, it is not professional counseling it's not psychological debriefing it's not a detailed discussion of the distressing event and it's not asking people to analyze what happened or put time and events in order and although PFA involves being available to listen to people's stories, it is not pressurizing people to tell you their feelings or reactions to an event. And that, that is very important. Um, and again, um, I think we've missed a slide there. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I'm wrong. So frontline workers, again, who did we target this at? Well, we targeted it at everybody working in the hospital. And we got phone calls from um, different staff who were not clinical staff, um, you know, people working in portering. We got calls from people working in admin. Um, so, but generally speaking, staff who have a diagnosis or are overwhelmed um, in general with the prospect of the tsunami that was you know anticipated in the first wave that we got actually probably in the third wave in Ireland and um, staff who have a, a, a diagnosis of COVID-19 staff who have a colleague who have a diagnosis and they're worried about them staff who have specific high stress roles such as emergency departments and the intensive care units and those with direct prolonged contact patient contact on a ward and um, I was, you know, delighted to see the, uh, the fact that working very long shifts had, a, had an impact on, on um, staff because that would, would have been my sense that the longer you're having face-to-face -face patient contact with somebody with um, patients with COVID-19, the more at risk of stress you would be. And people worrying about their own family members, maybe elderly parents or or young people with with a condition um, that it will put them at risk. And all those caring roles at home and pressures of work at home are um, added stress and pressure with no outlets um, or very little outlets bar walking and cycling within the restricted guidelines. So 
people, you know, would be feeling very stressed, but that is normal given this current situation. And it is about not, um, it is about not um, overestimating what, what difficulties people may be having, but actually really looking at what data and what um, people are saying themselves. Because for many people, they will be okay and they will have what we call post-traumatic growth. And um, some people will um, get a lot of benefit from experiencing this difficult experience and it might change their lives in very positive ways. Back to again what um, Professor Greenberg was saying, many feel they uh, might not be doing a good enough job because we know that many of us working as health professionals have a tendency towards being perfectionistic and um, we also know that we are that there's a level of natural resilience that we learn on the job um, from the beginning, from, from when we train. Um, and also there's lots of new pressures associated with the occupational um, health and safety guidelines and putting the PPE on, making sure that hygiene um, is strictly followed. So that is an added pressure. Next slide, please. So this was this was just our what we did um, we had a swift queue virtual appointment request um, and a staff member could do that directly or through the app. Um, and I know lots of other services um, tried this as well, which is was wonderful across. Um, I see Mona there. CHI did a wonderful job over there and um, my colleagues and James's um, in the matter in um, Beaumont and in St. Vincent's um, all put in these services or similar versions of them, uh, bespoke to their own settings. And staff might have been identified by Oc Health. So I might get a call from Oc Health where they'd had a chat with a staff member and ask, could they have a call back? So initially um, we did a dedicated service um, and we took turns, we did timetables and we made ourselves available from half seven in the morning to eight o'clock at night on a rota seven to seven, just initially. And we rode back on that because as we suspected, the demand wasn't um, huge from the call service side of it. But we did get we did get calls um, nonetheless. And I think over time, if that service was in place, it would grow. Um, next slide, please. So back to um, the basic needs, this doesn't really need to be said. Most importantly, staff need to have rest. They need to eat properly. They need to engage in physical activity, even if it's getting out of the PPE and walking around the hospital building just to get fresh air. And the importance of staying in touch with family and friends and avoid the obvious unhealthy um, coping strategies. And I noticed on um, one of the, the, the um, factors of coping was humor on uh, Tara's presentation. And I just laughed to myself because um, Freud back in the day, whether you, whether you like Freud or not, um, he did start the whole, he was the father of the talking therapies per se, but he did say that um, uh, humor is the highest order of defense. So if you've got to use one, it's one of the better defense mechanisms to use. Um, next slide, please. So pressures in work, again, um, there was lots of papers written and um, on this, and certainly from the King's Fund, Michael West referred to this, that pressures in work are increasing. And these were increasing pre-pandemic because we, we have had this sense of trying, because of recession and because of resources, trying to do um, more with less. And then we hit a pandemic and we're in trouble. Um, so pressures in work are definitely increasing. And the, due to the constant um, extra demands, and we're facing more demands with trying to get patients who've been afraid to come into the hospital um, to get them seen um, as, as cases in COVID-19 decrease. So the pressures are never ending. And it's, it's about not being afraid to actually ask for help. 
and to name this in your teams, with your managers, with senior management. Excessive workload is something that really needs to be discussed because if it's not discussed, it's not safe. Um, so support to managers of frontline workers to regularly monitor staff to ensure good quality communication. And certainly, I'm sure all the acute hospitals, the communication from the CEOs were regular and um, were very helpful and very useful to have that. And the importance of a compassionate communicator um, at senior level um, communicates indirectly to staff in very powerful ways. Ensure rest breaks and communication. Many hospitals set up um, comfort rooms. And years ago, there used to be the nurse's sitting room. I remember going into Baggett Street and um, there were so many sidebar conversations in that nurse's sitting room, I can tell you, that probably um, helped uh, prevent issues <laughs> arising. Um, back to peer support and allow workers to implement necessary self-care activities. Um, encouraging peer support, as I said, acknowledge that people face similar stressors, that we're all in this boat together. And, you know, reminding staff as well of the other supports that are always available um, pre-pandemic, which would be the EAP, Employee Assistance Programme and Counselling that people can be referred to. So um, just finally, um, we started a um, and, and uh, Damien Lowry in the matter and colleagues from Trinity and from all the f major five acute hospitals in, in adult services in Dublin. We started a survey which was um, began in September and um, we have Charlotte Wilson and um, David Heavey, Sharon O'Sullivan. Uh, Niall Pender, Sinead Mulhern, Paul Dalton and myself got together and um, our, I'm only going to give you a little taster because I'll leave that up to Damien to, to um, when the first papers hopefully come out soon um, and he'll be um, probably representing us and talking about that. But next slide please. Um, our first survey, we had 1900 um, people, which was a great um, number, even though throughout the, the hospitals, there's probably, you know, three to 5,000 in each hospital staff members. And these were the initial um, participants. Next slide, please. And from those demographics, just briefly, 80%, similar to all the research we've already seen of respondents were female, 33% were nurses, 24% health and social care professions, 21% were doctors, 22% were other healthcare professionals, and greater than 60% were moderate or higher for anxiety, depression and trauma. And again, like um, Neil um, cautioned that you know this may not mean that all of these people will have difficulties later on but it's a flag of concern approximately 10 to 15 percent scored in the severe range for anxiety depression and trauma and that will kind of fit with previous research on epidemics predictors of mental health distress nursing profession no surprises there female gender no surprises there either early career status pre-existing stress on all predicted distress and level of frontline exposure to COVID-19. And um, somebody came up with the clever WI5H, the WISH study, um, which I thought was really clever. Um, next slide, please. So this was our February and we've one, one more to go. Um, this was our February survey participants participation um, number, which was um, 1,100. And we mightn't even have all the data in yet. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing the analysis as we go through this. So um, I'm nearly finished. And I just wanted to um, acknowledge that um, other influencers for me in this pandemic and um, 
have been um, people like Joan Halifax. And Joan Halifax is, is, is a, a Buddhist nun and an academic. And she has done an awful lot of work on the concept um, of moral injury and um, how to stay using mindfulness uh, uh, and meditation, how to stay grounded. And there are myself and Elma Hederman did a small, um, very clinically driven paper on um, just different types of mindfulness practices that are very short that people can use on the job. And I think with, you know, looking at moral injury in particular and um, bits of um, the, the, the whole concept of mindful self-compassion, which is particularly useful for um, feeling guilt and shame are um, techniques that can be used down the line to support and help people. Um, it was a, um, an honor to be able to help staff in this time. And I hope that these services will be continued in the future um, because they are not just needed um, for the pandemic. So thank you everybody for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, Veronica. That was really fascinating. Uh, I did, I, I think a lot of us had heard that there was uh, great things going on in Tala Hospital and it's great to see the numbers around that. Um, I don't know if, the, if anybody uh, on the group online has any uh, questions that they'd like for Dr. O'Doherty. I'm just looking there. Uh, Uh, maybe Veronica, I'd ask you a quick question myself, and um, if that's okay. Uh, I noticed that you uh, commented on uh, the importance of eating properly. Um, and I wonder what you think about how that fits in with the progressive diminution of uh, canteen and uh, cafeteria services in hospitals over the last decade. <laughs> I, uh, I think. Um trying to get healthy eating is is very um helpful and i think i think a lot of uh chefs in hospitals are working on this um and certainly trying to uh, get rid of the 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 fast sugary drinks and all of those things but i suppose um it's also in in the context of a pandemic people were probably eating more in their uh, less in the canteen and more um, privately in offices and bringing in their own um, lunches um, i don't know if i'm answering you on that but um no, i think it's interesting uh, because food i think is of great comfort to people but uh over the last decade or so the canteens are all having their hours cut back further mm. and further um, and certainly yeah. if you work night shift the ac the access to canteen is very poor absolutely and i know we we have yeah and, and i, I it, it's a number of years now where a lot of hospitals have um those vending machines for night staff um and certainly i, I know some of us here might remember the canteen being open at night um, years ago, where we were able to go in and people often on night duties, you know, elected to have people bring in um, cakes and, and different things to, to share. And so there was a community at night that was very helpful. And I think that sense of isolation at night um, is, 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 you know, could be addressed further and could be looked at maybe. Um, so I agree. We have, we have another question uh, from Jonathan Egan, just uh, asking, could you explain what you mean by mindful compassion? Um, well, the mindful self-compassion is a um, developed by Kirsten Neff um, and Chris Germer as a particular program, but it's not new to mindfulness in general. Paul Gilbert um, did an awful lot of work on, on compassion based approaches. But there's a whole school of thought that has emerged in the last probably 10 years, uh, probably since at least 2011, 2012. Um, and it, 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 it is about putting your, learning how to put your own oxygen mask on first. And, and that is something healthcare staff probably don't do. They, they probably reach out to others first. 
So it is about learning that unless you're well in yourself, you're not going to be of any use to others. And um, often, again, it's about learning how to appreciate your own skills and gifts. And, you know, one, one of my favorite sayings um, is from um, John Kabat-Zinn. And he says that uh, people are like leaves on a tree with each um, particular person having their own angle on the sun. And there's something in that even for team leaders and for, for um, senior management to recognize that everybody has skills and everybody deserves to shine in their own particular way. And if we can capitalize, not in a cynical way, but we can capitalize on those people's gifts and skills, then we can really do fantastic work together and collaborate um, in a wonderful way. And it is about recognizing that, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm going off piste here. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I think that's just because you're very passionate on your subject. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, O'Doherty. You're welcome.